Most Holy Father, salvation does belong to you. And Father, there are times when it is not well with our souls. But Father, we pray that you help it to be. Help us to take refuge in you, to put our confidence and our trust in you, that it might be well with our souls, regardless of what happens. Father, you are so good and so mighty, and you always keep your promises. May we put our every hope in you. Bless us, Father, as we study your word and as we attempt to come away from here, loving one another, loving our neighbors, loving you better and deeper. And Father, we thank you for Jesus, through whom we have these relationships, through whom we have eternal life. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening, church. We are continuing our series on meekness. Um, and, and I know that we said at the beginning of last week, how are we going to make a whole, whole quarter out of meekness? But I think that even just in the first lesson, I think that we began to see there's more to meekness than maybe we might have initially thought. At least there's more to the biblical idea that the Bible means that the biblical authors meant when they used words that were translated into the word meekness in English. So if we're going to understand what should I be thinking when I read meek in Matthew 5.5, 5, when Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth, or what should I, I think when I read the passage that we read last week that Jesus was quoting from Psalm 37 and verse 11 that the meek will inherit the land. What should, I, what should I be thinking about when I hear that? Because I think that first of all we have to put aside some of the definitions that we have made cliches about meekness. Meekness doesn't mean weakness. We say that all the time. Meekness doesn't mean weakness. We, we often say that meekness is a meek person is somebody who's really powerful and somebody who's really strong, but they just control their, their strength and their power. I think we have to put that aside. Um, I think we have to put aside most of the, the definitions of the English word meekness and really dive in and, and say, well, what, what did some of these in, in first in Hebrew, what did, what did those words mean? And we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, this evening. But first of all, let's talk about what we ended on last week. Meekness is about patiently enduring the present in light of the future. And maybe the, the inference or the implication is already there. Um, but I think tonight especially we're going to see this, that meekness assumes the presence of an enemy. Meekness assumes the presence of an enemy. You cannot, not it's hard to, or most of the time you don't, but you, you cannot exercise meekness in the absence of pain and suffering. Being meek assumes, assumes that you are being hurt, oppressed, being put through pain, that you are suffering at the hands of someone or something. Okay, so if we're going to understand what meekness is and what it means when Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth or what the psalmist meant when he said that the meek will inherit the land, then we have to understand that meekness assumes the presence of an enemy, that there is a person or a thing who is causing conflict, oppression, pain, or suffering. Now, if you were to take a concordance or maybe... Now we don't use concordances so much as we do the little, uh, um, what's that even called? Magnifying glass, that's right, the magnifying glass, the search button, right? And you click on the magnifying glass in your, in your Bible app and you type in the word meek, you'd find that it doesn't show up very many times in English, right? Uh, maybe you did that last week, or meekness. Those words don't show up a whole lot of times, especially in the Old Testament. Really just, I think, maybe three in the English standard. But the Hebrew word anav is the word in Psalm 37 and verse 11, anav. It's translated as meek. So when the psalmist says the meek, the anav, will inherit the land, that's really what we're trying to get at, isn't it? It's not so much what does the English word meek mean. 
Because that, that's been through, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of connotation and just different culture and, and all of these things. What, what did the Hebrew word anav, what did the psalmist mean when he talked about meek? Because that's what our Lord means, even though that's written in Greek in the New Testament, he's still quoting from the Psalms. So what does it mean to be the anav? What does it mean that God makes promises to the anav, to the meek? What does it mean that the psalmist writes that God will save and uphold and rescue, redeem the anav, the meek? I think as we look at at tonight, we're going to look at two different psalms. And what I like to say is the psalms, they either celebrate or anticipate God's salvation. So they either celebrate God's salvation, like, yes, you did it, thank you, yes, that was great, thank you for everything you've done for me, or they anticipate God's salvation. Now, sometimes they anticipate God's salvation in a very positive tone, like, I know you're going to rescue me, and you're, you're my stronghold, and I put my trust in you. And other times they anticipate God's salvation in sort of a negative tone, like, when are you going to show up, God? When are you going to fix this? When's this going to get better? But either way, it's an anticipation that you're the only one. You're the only one who can fix this. You're the only one that can save me. You're the only one that can make this right. The first psalm that we're going to look at in Psalm 9, so if you've got your Bible, that's where we'll be. Psalm 9, it's really a celebration of God's salvation. So the first one celebrates, the second one anticipates God's salvation. And again, I want us to think through why these are songs why God wanted his people, both the Hebrew people, the Israelites, the Jews, to have these songs. And then as his people began to be made up of Jew and Gentile, after Jesus, and Jesus brings all of us, why the Apostle Paul would say, you need to continue to sing the Psalms. Why is it that the church needs to sing about the salvation of the Anav, the salvation and the rescuing of the meek? Why, why do we continue to need to sing that? So let's think about that as we read. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. So the beginning of your psalm at Psalm 9, right above verse 1, it says, a psalm of whom? David, right? David, right? So sometimes we try to look at it and we say, okay, well, who, who is the enemy he's talking about, right? The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Did David have one enemy or did David have lots of enemies? Lots of enemies, right? W- which enemy do you think he's talking about? We don't know, right? We don't know. And, and is it important that we know? No. In fact, for the sake of songs, it's usually best that we don't know. I was thinking about, you, you ever listen to a country song? You know, like one of those, you know, my dog died and my girlfriend left me and my truck broke down. You know, one of those songs, you know. And, and they're, they're not ever real specific. They're just specific enough, right? And almost all songs are that way. They're, they're sort of general, right? Why is that? Why are they general? Somebody raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand. Just tell me. What do you, what do you, why, why, do they, why do they keep it general? Why? They very rarely name the girl's name or the dog's name, right? Why, why do they want it to be general? Yeah, there you go. So that you can relate to it, right? Because you're listening to it and you say, yeah, my dog died too and my truck broke down too. You know, and so you feel like, yeah, yeah, I can relate to this. Yeah, that guy, he, you know, and, and so you, you think, you put yourself into the song. You, you say, that's, that's like my relationships. That's like my situation. That's like, that's like me. And if it was really specific, you say, well, that's, That's a song about David. This isn't a song about David. It's maybe a song that David gave to God's people, but it's a song about God's people. And it's a song about God's enemies, right? 
And that's why they needed this song. Both in the times where they were celebrating sal salvation from God, right? You, you did it. You showed up. You destroyed them. Yes, their, their name will never be remembered. You did what you said you were going to do. You kept your promises. But even in those moments where the enemy is still outside the gate, where the enemy is still shooting arrows over the wall, where the enemy is still very much present and very much real and very much oppressing and afflicting God's people, is it good for God's people to sing this song? You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. Is it good to sing that? Because you're saying this is inevitable, right? Is that hard to remember in the moment when you have enemies that are firing arrows at you and you have enemies that are trying to break down the gate and you have enemies that are slaughtering your family and friends and you're starving because of the siege that's going on outside the city walls? Now, those are all very real situations that God's people found themselves in over the years, but you find yourself in situations where you have enemies, right? Where they may not be physical arrows that are being shot at you, but they may be emotional arrows, and you have pain, and you have suffering, and you feel oppressed, and you feel burdened and down, and, and then the psalmists say over and over again, the downfall of all of those who stand opposed to the people of God, the enemy's downfall is inevitable. Inevitable. You see, because that's, that's the secret of meekness, isn't it? As we said last week, it is enduring the present in light of the future, right? Enduring the present in light of the future. That in the future, it is inevitable that my enemies will be defeated. It is inevitable. But that's not what our heart tells us in the moment. In the present moment when you're suffering and being persecuted, in the present moment you feel like your enemies being victorious and stomping on your grave, that that's inevitable. But faith tells you in spite of how it feels right now, their downfall, your enemy's downfall is inevitable. The wicked and the evil who oppress you will be destroyed. Verse 7, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. Do you see how all of these sort of in parallel describe the reign? The Lord sits enthroned forever. And what's, and what's his reign look like? What kind of a God is he? How does he reign? How does he rule? How does he judge with justice and righteousness and uprightness? Now, we've talked about this before in various classes, but when we think about justice, when we say justice is served, we usually think about somebody being punished, right? Yeah, we usually think about somebody being punished, and that's certainly a part of justice, isn't it? That if the wicked and the evil continue to oppress people and they're not punished and they're not stopped, then it's not just, it's not right, it's not upright, it's not righteous. So God brings down the enemy. But it's not just about the bad guy losing. It's not just about the bad guy being punished. It's also about the person who's being oppressed. When we say justice, we mean both that God brings down the enemy, but also that he brings up. He brings up the widow, and he brings up the fatherless, and he brings up the helpless, and he brings up the poor. And when evil people take advantage of, and rob, and kill, and rape, and destroy, that God not only will inevitably bring them down, but all of the people that were hurt unfairly, God brings up justice. Verse 9, the Lord is a stronghold for the, what? Oppressed, right? Because that's what this is all about. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. Now, what's a stronghold? When you think of a stronghold, you usually think of like, what, like walls, right? Like some safe place to hide. 
and you think inside here, no enemy can get me. But, but no matter how strong or how thick or how big or how tall those walls are, no matter how many guards stand on those walls, an enemy can still break through. Who is, what is the only real stronghold? The Lord, right? Put your trust in the Lord. Let him be the stronghold for the oppressed. Why? Because eventually God is going to bring down the oppressor and bring up the oppressed. But the Lord sits in throne. Oh, sorry, I was going back. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. See, that's, that's the heart of meekness. In order to be the anav, in order to be the meek, yes, it implies oppression and suffering. It, it implies that there is an enemy who is hurting you. You cannot be the anav. You cannot be the meek without having an enemy, without pain and without suffering. But it also implies this kind of stuff as well, that you are seeking and putting your trust not in yourself and in your own strength and in your own power. Sometimes I think when we define meekness and we say things like, well, meekness doesn't mean me weakness, right? I really am strong and I could beat you up if I wanted to, you know, but I'm just being meek and I'm holding it all in, right? You know, when we say, well, meekness doesn't mean I'm weak, it just means I'm really strong, but I'm, I'm under control. Sometimes, sometimes that may be the case. But sometimes it may be that you really are weak. You really can't win. Now, as we get into the New Testament, and as we begin to understand more of the picture that God lays out, we see that flesh and blood, as Paul says, it's not really our enemy. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the powers and the authorities in the unseen places, right? And the greatest enemy, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy that Jesus will destroy is what? Death. And that's an enemy that we all face, isn't it? And that enemy begins attacking us from day one. From day one. We are born mortal people who are slowly or sometimes quickly wearing out and dying. And that is an enemy you can try to stop, right? I mean, we're all going to try to stop death as long as we can. And we're going to put as many walls between us and death as we possibly can. And we're going to try to hold him off and fend him off as long as we can. But in the end, death will claim us. But Jesus will destroy that enemy and will raise up his people, right? That's what the gospel is all about. So there, there, this is what Anav is is realizing in the end, I can't stop myself from dying. In the end, I really am pretty weak and pretty helpless. Not just in that mortal situation, but in lots of situations in my life. Where sometimes there is nothing I can do about it except trust the one who promises me he will bring down every enemy. And that when there is somebody in your life that is making your life difficult, understanding that that person, they're not really the enemy. They may very well, though, be partnered with your enemy and be in collusion with the enemy of Satan. And surrendering them to God and to say, I may not be able to do anything about this right now, but God can, and I will trust him and I will seek him, and he will be my stronghold, and I will say, it is well with my soul. Verse 11, sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds, for he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the, what's the word? Afflicted. Would it surprise you if I told you that that word that's translated afflicted is actually the exact same word, anav, that Hebrews, or I mean, sorry, Psalm 37 and verse 11 translates as meek. 
He does not forget the cry of the meek. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. He does not forget the cry of the oppressed. See, meekness in the biblical sense, a nav, it, it assumes affliction. It assumes suffering. It assumes pain. When the psalmist talks about the anav, he's talking about the people who are suffering, the people who are oppressed, the people that are hurting, the people who have an enemy, the people who need a deliverer, the people who need a savior, and the people who put their trust in God. And in all honesty, sometimes I feel a little bit guilty even talking about ourselves as the anav, as the meek. I was listening to a podcast this week and it reminded me of a statistic that I'd heard before. Would it surprise you to know that if, if I told you that there were a million slaves in the world today, that in, in spite of the fact that, that slavery is illegal in every part of the world, there are still, would it, would it surprise you if I said there were a million slaves? There's not just a million. Would it surprise you if I said there's 10 million? Can you imagine 10 million people in slavery? The number's not 10 million either. And it's not 20, and it's not 30. It's 40 million people. There are more people right now who are enduring modern slavery than there have been at any other time in history. See, this is the kind of thing that the psalmist means when he says, God, does not forget the cry of the anav. God does not forget the cry of the meek. God does not forget the cry of the afflicted. And yes, we have enemies, and yes, we suffer, and yes, things are hard, but I feel like I don't really know hardship. I don't really know suffering. I don't really know pain. But it's comforting to know, one, that God will not forget those who do, but two, but two, that when I go through my very worst suffering, because chances are, for me, my worst suffering is in front of me, and I better learn how to sing these songs now, and maybe your worst suffering is in front of you, and you need to learn to sing these songs now, that God does not forget the cry of the Anav. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. When his people say, God, this is unbearable. And I can't stop it. And it's happening to me. And I've tried to run and I've tried to hide, but you are the only stronghold I have. And I trust you that God will deliver the meek. Be gracious, verse 13, be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gates of death. Does that, does that remind you of a phrase in the New Testament? The gates of death? What did Jesus say? He said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades, yeah. Hades will not, that's the realm of death. The gates of the realm of death will not prevail against my church, right? And what is it that the psalmist says? That God is the one who lifts up from the gates of death. Death cannot keep God from hearing the cries and remembering the cries of the anaf, the meek. Those who are afflicted and oppressed, who suffer, who have enemies and that God entrusts entrust their enemies, surrender their enemies to God. God will even raise them up from the gates of death that I may recount all your praises that in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. Verse 15, the nations have sunk in the pit that they have made, right? And that's, that's a common theme throughout the scriptures that, that really the wicked, and we talked about this last week even, I think, that the wicked think that they're shooting you with arrows, but their arrows actually pierce whom? Themselves. They, they think they're setting a trap for you, but really they're setting a trap for themselves. It's silly, I know, but I think about Wile E. Coyote. You know what I'm saying? 
you know? I mean, every time. And the, the, the Roadrunner was really, truly weak, right? I mean, he was just beep, beep, that's it. I mean, he couldn't do, he could run really fast, but even his speed couldn't outrun the coyote. It was the fact that the coyote's traps always sprung on him. And that's the psalmist's hope. Not hope like wishful thinking, but hope like confident expectation. I know that God will cause all of their traps to spring on them. The nations have sunk in the pit that they have made. In the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall return to Sheol. That's the Hebrew equivalent of Hades, the realm of the dead. All the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. And the hope of the, what does it say in English? Poor, in Hebrew, it's anav. The hope of the anav, the hope of the afflicted, the hope of the poor, the hope of the meek shall not perish forever. This is our song. This is our music. This is what we sing in the good times and the bad. God will remember. I don't have to fret. I don't have to worry. I don't have to despair. I don't have to think that the way that things are will always be this way. And the reason we need these songs is because it doesn't feel that way, does it? Every time we hear about a shooting, every time we hear the word cancer, every time someone passes away, every time we think it just keeps happening and God says not forever, I will bring down every evil and wickedness, I will destroy death itself and I will raise up my people. The wicked, the wicked shall return to Sheol but the righteous I will raise up from the gates of death. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. Yes. Yes. That's what we need to pray. That's what we need to sing. We are the enough. We are the enough. And that means... That means both that in our personal suffering, in our collective suffering, we both trust God, but then we also, I, I think it also necessitates us befriending and bringing in and helping and associating with the truly anav of the world, doesn't it? And, and sharing with them hope. Because there are some people who are afflicted and who are poor, but who don't know to put their trust in God. They don't know to put their trust in God. And that's our job, church, is to reach out to the enough and to tell them to reach out to the poor, to reach out to the afflicted, to reach out to the oppressed, to associate ourselves with them, to say, we suffer too and we want to suffer with you and we want to give you the same hope that we have, that God, that God is God, that God rescues and remembers and hears the meek, the poor, the oppressed. Look at chapter 10. Again, now we more anticipate than celebrate, but same, same idea. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? You ever felt like that? There's a mom that I, I just heard about the last couple of weeks whose son is very, very sick. And she's struggling not only with her son's sickness, but also with her trust in God. And sometimes we allow our belief in God to hinge on what's going on in our situation, right? Because we feel like if you were there and if you cared and if you were good and if you were loving, you would fix this. But the more we dive into scripture, we know that's not a foreign feeling and that the gospel addresses that. And it says, God does hear you. God does hear your prayer. God does hear your worry. 
He hears this song, why do you stand far away? Why have you forsaken me? Why, God? And he says, just trust me, because someday it'll all be over. Someday, death itself will be destroyed. Cancer will be destroyed. Pain will be destroyed. Evil will be destroyed. Wickedness will be destroyed. Trust me that the Anav will inherit the world. In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they've devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Right? The anav, the the oppressed, the oppressed righteous person who trusts in God is saying, what's up with this? Right? What? What in the world are you doing, God? Why are you way out there somewhere and you're allowing these people to say, there's no God, and oppress the poor people and take advantage of people and walk all over people and you're not stopping it. Why don't you stop it? They're saying there is no God and you're not proving them wrong. His ways, the wicked, his ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As as for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages, in hiding places. He murders the innocent. The innocent, his eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. Do you see the picture? He's wicked. He's evil all the time. He's just coming up with new ways to take advantage of people. And the psalmist says, why don't you stop that? Why don't you do something about it? He says, there is no God. He's defying you. And he's taking advantage of people. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He'll never see it. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted, the anav, the meek. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account, but you do see You do see. The psalmist says, you do see. He thinks you don't see, God. He thinks you don't hear. He thinks you'll never hold him accountable. He thinks he's getting away with it. He thinks you're not there, but you do see, for you note mischief and vexation that you may take it into your hands. To you, the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. Do you see the the synonymous terms that the psalmist uses for the anav, for the meek, the afflicted, helpless, fatherless? In verse 18, in a second, he'll say oppressed. It's what it means to be the meek, is to be the poor, the helpless, the oppressed, but to trust your oppression, your suffering, your pain, your enemies to God because he does hear and he is taking note. Verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the anav, the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice See, here's that word again, to do justice to the fatherless. See, that's, that's justice too. Justice to the fatherless and justice to the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Meekness assumes the presence of an enemy, assumes the presence of helplessness, assumes the presence of poverty. So can you see why it's such a completely radical idea to say the Anav will inherit the earth? It's almost laughable, isn't it? 
It's almost laughable for Jesus or for the psalmist to say, you are going to be the people who win. No, you're not the ones with the big, strong armies. And you're not the strong and powerful. You're, you're not the rich and powerful. You're not the one taking advantage of people and climbing to the top by stepping on everybody else. That's not you, but you're going to win. You're going to win. Why? Because you put your trust in me and I will raise you up. If you will only put your trust in me and seek me and make me your stronghold, I will make sure that you win. You will be victorious. That's why, like 1 Corinthians 15, a chapter that's all about resurrection, how he could end it by saying, we are more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors. We win. We win. And how in Romans chapter 8, when he's talking about the same ideas about the redemption of the creation, how he could say, how he could say nothing, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. It's a laughable idea in the flesh to say the anav will inherit the earth. It's a laughable idea to say the meek, the afflicted, the poor, the downtrodden, the stepped on, those with enemies that are bigger and stronger and more powerful and more rich than they are, that they will win and be victorious and inherit the earth. That's a laughable idea, but that's exactly what Jesus says. And everything we've been talking about on Sunday mornings about the glory of our king, can't you see it? That he says, listen, in this upside down kingdom, if you want to look for the winners, you look at the people that are serving. If you want to look for the royalty, you look for the people that are laying down their life for someone else. I know it looks like there are certain types of people, like the psalmist says, that are winning right now. And we can look around at our world right now too and say, yeah, I don't know why I'm such a nice person because it seems like if you're mean and cruel, that you, you get ahead a lot better. You know, if you lie and steal and cheat, you get, a, you get away with it. And who's stopping them? And they just do whatever they want to and they get away with it. And God says over and over again, and our songs teach us, and the gospel itself teaches us, it will not always be this way. The wicked will perish. Their time is but a vapor. And your time is forever. You cannot lose with Jesus. You cannot lose when you put your trust in Yahweh. So let's end with this thought. The meek are afflicted, but they surrender their enemies to God. What would it look like if we surrendered our enemies to God and if we spread that message of hope with the anav of the earth, the meek and the afflicted, that if you will but surrender your enemies to God and trust him, he will deliver you. If you put yourself in Christ Jesus, you will live forever. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will help us to seek to be meek, that you will help us to seek you, to put our trust and our faith in you, to make you our stronghold, to know that our enemies their downfall is inevitable and that your victory is already assured and that if we but belong to you, then ours is as well. Father, thank you for justifying us, for sanctifying us, and for glorifying us in Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church.